Samson. It's four weeks. We're going to take the next four weeks and look at the life and character of Samson. It is often understood that Samson, most people know Samson uh, to be with Delilah, and they hear the story of Samson and Delilah, and Delilah tricks him, and he tells the secret to Delilah of his strength, which is his long hair, and everything comes apart. And most people know the story of Samson just like that. But there is actually a lot to Samson's life and a lot to story uh, to his character leading up to that huge fall that we're going to look at in the next four weeks. And we need to be thankful for these types of characters in the Bible because we get to be on the outside looking in, right? We get to be on the other side of their life and we can relate to their shortcomings without experiencing the consequences that they did. But if we are not doers of the word and all we are are hearers of the word, we also can fall into the same traps that Samson did. I want to tell you a a story of one of my first pitfalls in the financial world. When I graduated uh, high school, um, actually I was in the middle of college, I got my first credit card and it happened to be uh, an American Express card. And yeah, some of you are already like, oh, now get this. And I don't know what they're teaching in high school these days, but in high school, they didn't teach us how to use American Express. And for some reason, I didn't read the fine print and all that. So I thought it was a revolving line of credit and we can just add up a bunch of stuff and just pay it off little by little as you know the months go on. So uh, you know, I racked up like $1,000 when the first month put like turkey and chicken dinners on there and groceries and I think we bought a couch on it and just racked up a lot of money on the American Express card but at least back in the day in fact I don't even know today because I don't have one but back in the day you had to pay that thing off right is it still like that today yeah you don't know yeah (laughs) liars you guys know somebody has an American Express you got to pay it off within that month it wasn't revolving to where you could just so anyway, it was a snowball effect, though. The, the point is, uh, that American Express card that I had at 20 years old, it, was a, it just carried on more debt, and it just created a huge snowball to where I couldn't really pay it off because uh, they, they, it was due that month. And in the same way, Samson's decisions in his life were like a snowball effect. Oftentimes, people think that Samson made a huge bad decision with Delilah and ruined his life, and that's actually not the case. His ruin and his demise came many, many years before he even met Delilah. It was small compromises, little by little by little in his life. Decisions that he made, decision after decision after decision that were bad decisions that led ultimately to his demise in his life. And we're going to look at that and we're going to look at what we can learn. And what I want to encourage you to do this morning and over the next few weeks is compare your life to Samson's life. Compare your decision making and how you think and how you operate to what Samson thought and how he operated as well. Samson had so much potential. Did you know that? He had tremendous potential, tremendous favor on his life. He had so many strengths. He was clearly gifted. And yet, and yet those poor choices eventually cost him everything. And that I think we can relate to because you have greatness in your life. You are favored by God. God has his favor on your life, on you. He has his blessing on your life. And he has injected huge amounts of favor and greatness in every one of us. Tremendous potential. We're fighting the devil down here. And he is up here fighting us because he knows our potential. And God has placed so much potential in every single one of us. But... If we are not careful, just like Samson, if we make poor decision after poor decision and those little compromises in our walk with God and in our walk with our neighbors, then we, we too will end up like Samson did. And I pray that doesn't happen, but we will see here in just a moment that it's pretty common, actually, for many of us. Okay, so Judges chapter 13. Let's look at this. Judges chapter 13. We're going to look at uh, the first five verses here with the birth of Samson. Then we're going to skip over to verse 24. <clears throat> And then we'll stand here in just, in just a moment for chapter 14. All right, so Judges chapter 13. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. 
a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites and a wife who was sterile and remained childless. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, You are sterile and childless, but you are going to conceive and have a son. Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean, because you will conceive and give birth to a son. No razor may be used on his head, because the boy is to be a Nazarite, set apart to God from birth, and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, what the angel there is saying uh, to her is a Nazarite vow. Basically, the Nazarite vow recorded in Numbers a Nazarite vow is four things. You can't d- touch anything dead. You can't eat anything dead. No razor. You can't cut your hair, so don't put any razor to your head. You can't, um, and you also can't drink. You can't drink any alcohol or any fermented drink. So he's basically saying you're giving, you're going to be giving a Nazarite vow, not only to you, but also to your son, Samson. Okay, let's skip over to verse 24. I'm, I've skipped several verses there. Basically, the woman goes to the, the husband and says, hey, an angel showed up to me. And this is what he said. And so they talked about it. The angel reappeared to both the man and the wife um, to confirm what was just said. And then we get to verse 24 in chapter 13. The woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Menadan between Zorah and Estal. Okay, verse, chapter 14, verse number one. Let's stand for this. Let's stand together for this one. <clears throat> Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all your people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, go get her. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling over Israel. So Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. That's probably an understatement. He liked her. Sometime later, when he went back to marry her, pay attention to this, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. In it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. Remember, remember the Nazarite vow. So he scooped out with his hands, he ate as he went along in this carcass. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Let me tell you a riddle, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. Tell us your riddle, they said. Let's hear it. And he replied, out of the eater, something to eat, and out of the strong, something sweet. For three days, they could not give the answer. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to rob us? Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing, You hate me! You don't really love me! You've been given a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. (laughs) I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? (laughs) She cried. Ted, that was bad. She cried. The whole seven days of the feast, so on the seventh day he finally told her because she continued to press him. And she in turn explained the riddle to her people. Now her people were the Philistines. All right. Father, just open this up to us, Lord. Reveal to us, Holy Spirit, what you want us to see. Speak to every individual listening to this message. Help us to see. Help us to hear. Help us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. So Samson here, he is 
not acting very wisely. <clears throat> Again, his life and the demise of his life that's coming in a few chapters later, it actually starts right here. It starts with him making some pretty poor decisions. And that's oftentimes how lives can get ruined. It's not a huge one big step or one big decision that will ruin your life, but oftentimes it can be a series of small decisions that will ruin your life. I haven't met anybody, when I've counseled people and I talk to people, I haven't met anybody yet in my years of ministry that has come into my office and said, you know, one day I just woke up and I just wanted to ruin my life on that day. You know, I just woke up and I just wanted to spend all the money, empty out all the accounts, go gamble everything away, and file for bankruptcy the next week. I, you know, I just, I just felt called to do that. I've never had anybody say, I've never had anybody come to me and say, you know, I just woke up one day and thought, I'm going to ruin my marriage of 25 years. That sounds like a pretty good agenda today. So I'm going to go look for somebody and do this with them and that with them and just ruin everything that we built together. Nobody wakes up and says, with this one decision, I think I'm going to destroy everything that I have built. It's not that way. How many do we, how many we know, though? We know that it, it's little compromises. It's little decisions. It's subtle things that you can't even see that, that creep up on you, that destroy your life. And that's what was happening here with Samson. The thing about Samson is his accomplishments are legendary. He, I mean, his strength is legendary. If I were to ask you, who's the, who's the strongest man in the Bible? You'd probably say Samson. His, his accomplishments. And remember the pillars? He pushed the pillars that we're going to read here on week number four. He pushed them down and the whole, everything came crashing down. I mean, how many of you kill a, a lion with your bare hands? You know? Nobody. His, his strength, his accomplishments are legendary, but so are his weaknesses. <clears throat> so are his weaknesses. Samson was an incredibly strong man. And this is something that I want you to get. Samson was an, he was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will. He was an incredibly strong man with a dangerously weak will, and it led to his demise. But Samson is just like us. We have incredible potential that God gives us, but we are weak. Satan likes to make strong men weak, but God likes to make weak men strong. <clears throat> Say that again. Satan likes to make strong men extremely weak. Especially guys and women. You have potential in you. You're on fire for the Lord. Have you ever noticed like when you want to get on fire for God, all of a sudden all hell breaks loose on your life? When you finally say, I'm going to go to church today, all of a sudden something goes wrong on Sunday morning because the enemy is after your soul. And that's what Satan does. He wants to make strong men, people who are filled with faith, people on fire for God. He wants to make you weak. And then, he went, and then God, though, he wants to take weak men and make them strong. So there's some attitudes here that make strong men weak that we see in Samson's life. And they're in your notes here. Let's look at this. The first attitude that makes strong men weak. And when I use that phrase men, it can also be for women, okay, ladies? So it's not just men. But the attitudes that make strong men weak or strong people weak is attitude number one, I want it. And that is lust. When you say, I want it. Verse number 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verse number 1. Samson went down to Timnah and saw that there was a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I've seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for, her, or for me as my wife. I want her. I want a woman. And oftentimes... Guys, that will make us weak when you say, I want this, or I want that, or I want this woman, or I want this quick hit, or I want this sexual thrill, or I want this. That will, that will bring you down every single time, even, even if we, it doesn't have to be related to a gender. I want this, or I want, the, I want this boat, or I want this house, or I want this car. Or I want, if we, the more we want, the more we want, the more we want, the more the enemy is going to jump on that, and he's going to bring strong people and make them weak. And we have to be careful. A man that wants something can oftentimes forget a about every step of logic. And that's exactly what Samson had. He forgot all of his logic and all of his upbringing because he saw a hot woman and he says, go get her for me. Samson was a sucker for smoking hot women. Do you know that? 
I mean, this is just the first woman. Just wait. Week number four. We're going to get into it. Samson was a sucker for smoking hot women. And he goes and he says, I want her. And I don't care what God says. I don't care about my Nazarite. Thou, I don't care about what my father says. Do you remember what the dad said? Hey, can't you find anybody in our own camp? Why do you have to go into Timnah to find, why do you have to go into the enemy's camp to find a woman? He says, I don't care about that. Go get her for me. And that's lust. And that is saying, I want her. And we got to be careful of that, saying, I want that, or I want that thing, or I want that person, or I want that job, or I want that position, or I want the status, and I want, I want, I want. All of that was started with Adam and Eve, and it carried over into Samson, it carries over into the people in the Bible, and guess who it also carries over to? All of us, right? Is that whole thing of, I want, I want, I want. And that is lust. There's slogans today. I mean, it's force-fed. It is just, it's fed into our mentalities. And parents with kids, watch what your kids are watching. Because the slogans these days on TV, it's all about consumerism, isn't it? It is. It's all about, uh, let me think of one. Um, uh, Burger King, have it your way, right? We know that one. Do you remember Sprite? Obey your thirst. Obey your thirst. Uh, the American Idol one, uh, I wrote this down. You are what this competition is all about. That's American Idol. You. You are what this competition is all about. How about Nike? Just do just do it. Just do it. And obviously talking about sports and getting out there, but that whole mentality of just do it. Uh, we got to be careful of that. And I mean, the list goes on and on and on as far as slogans that are, that are being fed to us that that it, it's all about us, and we should want what we should want, and we should get what we should want. And we have to be careful of that. In fact, in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, some of us are familiar with those, right? Exodus chapter 20, verse number 12, God actually says this. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Don't covet his manservant or maidservant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Also in those Ten Commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart. I mean, place him at the top. You shall have no other gods before me. That is what God is saying. And yet the consumerism and Samson, if we look at Samson's story, it's all about, I want her. Go get her for me. Samson said that about the Philistine woman, and he's willing to step out of the protection of his own people and into the enemy's camp to go get her, and that led to his demise. I would encourage you to prevent making the same mistake that Samson made by asking yourself this question. What is this going to cost me? Here's another one. Who is this going to affect in all of our desires of wanting things, we think that, well, it might just affect me. Really think through that one. Really think through that. It depends on what you want, I suppose. If you're going to go out and pay $600 a month for a car, who could that possibly affect? Just you and your paycheck? Or could that affect possibly your kids? Could that affect uh, the electric bill? Could that affect other people? I mean, could that affect if you want to go out and, and meet somebody or you want to step outside of your marriage and do some things that are not good that God clearly says, who is that going to affect? Just you? That quick hit, that quick visual hit, that quick decision, the small decisions of going after that person or that relationship, who do you think? Ask yourself, what is that going to cost you? Who is that going to affect? And oftentimes when we really start thinking about the ramifications of our choices and really thinking through, you know what, if I, I might want this, but this really is going to affect so-and-so. This really is going to affect a whole lot more than me. This really, this one decision will not only affect me, it could affect my children, it could affect the church, it could affect all kinds of believers, it could affect, all, you know, and just think through those things when we say we want it. Think through what it's going to cost you to do that. Uh, I remember, again, another sad story of mine. I, I wanted to get a, uh, my first car was a 1988 T-Top Camaro. Uh, and it wasn't blasting Johnny Be Good, but it was a T-Top Camaro. Anybody have a Camaro? T-Top Camaro? All right, I'm the only one. So it was a T-Top Camaro, and it didn't have a stereo, and I wanted to go down to the stereo shop and get just a stereo, you know, like $150, $200 stereo. And so I got in there, and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was looking for. I just wanted a stereo. Do you think I walked out of there with a $200 stereo? 
they saw me. They saw that I was naive. They said, well, really, you need this because, I mean, they gave me all kinds of reasons, and I bought the lie. I was like a fish on a hook, just totally suckered into buying a $3,000 stereo system. But, man, it was ripping. I mean, it sounded awesome. You could hear this car coming from like three blocks away. It was cool. It was really, really cool. But guess who that affected? Everybody. I mean, it affected me. It affected the house. It affected my wife. It affected the finances. I mean, I went in there for 150 bucks, and I walked out $3,000 later with two credit cards at 23% interest with the stereo. Boy, I hope you like your music. But isn't that real life sometimes? Come on, don't put me on blast. Come on, guys. You're, just, you're looking at me like I'm on an island out here. We've all done decisions like that before. Samson did. Samson did. He walks into the Philistine camp. And he says, I want her. And he's willing to put everything at risk to go get her. And that is lust. We've got to be careful of saying, I want it, depending on the cost. So my question for you is this, before we move on. What is it that you're wanting right now? Now, I'm not trying to, you know, pour water on your parade and all that, but what is it that you're wanting, that you're really wanting? Who is it going to affect? What is the true cost? Something to think about. Number two, the second attitude that led to Samson's demise, this is a big one, is I deserve it. And that's entitlement. So not only did Samson say, I want it, He's saying, I deserve it, <clears throat> and that's entitlement. If you look at verse number 8 through 9, it says in, verse, in chapter 14, 8 and 9, sometime later when he went back to marry her, here it is, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass, basically that he just killed. In it was a swarm of bees and some honey, which he scooped out with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some, and they ate it, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass. Now, the Nazarite vow recorded in Numbers 6, 1 through 21, like I mentioned, it means avoid corpse, corpses, don't touch or eat anything dead, no alcohol, and don't cut your hair. And Samson and Samuel actually were both under that covenant. Samson kills this lion out in the field, and in verse, what was it, verse number 8, it says that he turned aside. So it's kind of like this. He's walking along, he killed the lion, and he just kind of, turned aside to the lion, as in, almost like, look at what I did. Wow. Oh, there's some honey in there. I'm going to go down in that lion's carcass, and I'm going to scoop out that honey. I'm going to break. Now, here's the deal. He knows he's going to break his vow. He knows that he's going to break being a Nazarite to touch that dead carcass, and yet he does it anyway. Why? Because he killed that lion. Mm, wow, that's entitlement. And he looked, and the Bible says he looked to the side, to look at that line, almost gloating. It's like, look at what I did. And he goes in, and he scoops up the honey, and he breaks the vow. And he, and he touches, obviously, a dead thing, which is not good. And that is entitlement. He's so caught up in the fact that he killed this lion, he's willing to break a Nazarite vow to get the honey out of that carcass. Now, there's two mistakes that Samson is making here. Number one, he's believing a lie, which basically says, I deserve this. I'm willing to break a vow. And two, he's also misusing the strength that God gave him. And yet, this is what makes strong men weak. The pattern of thinking, this pattern, I've done this. That will destroy you. Look at what I've done. Look at what I have built. As we go along in life and as we build our homes or we build our businesses or we build our, our money or we build our kids or we build our sports teams or we build whatever, whatever. I mean, you can, whatever, okay, whatever. You can build whatever. And you look aside and say, ha, huh, look at what I've done. Look at what I've done. And you go back and you gloat or you go back and you're willing to break a covenant with God and you're willing to break something in the Bible or a commandment in the Bible to gloat in what you have. And we have to be careful with that. That's entitlement when we say that I deserve this. I've created this. Do you remember in uh, Castaway, Tom Hanks on the island? Do you remember that? I'll never forget that scene. He finally got the fire. And do you remember what he did? He was like, I, 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 have, look at what I have created. Bow down and worship me. And he's doing all this. 
And he's saying, I have created fire. And of course, that's a, a funny illustration there. And that, I mean, I enjoyed watching that. But we have got to be careful of entire entitlement. Look at what I have done. Especially if we're gonna if we're gonna run over people or break a covenant with God, or if we're gonna go against what the Bible says to sit there and gloat over what we have created. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds the house, its labors labor in vain, right? We gotta be careful of entitlement. It suffocates the favor of God. Now, listen, leaders in the church, leaders in the church, listen to this. Be careful. Entitlement suffocates the favor of God and it kills ministries. It kills it. it. It's the lid that keeps ministries from growing and expanding. For you to say, look at what I have done here, that will kill ministry from growing. Instead of, or another way to look at it is look at what God has done. Let's include more people in there to celebrate. Let's include more people in there. And I know I'm kind of going off here on this little thing, but we've got to be careful that we don't sit here and say, I deserve this. Uh, for me, it would be like, hey, you know what? This is my pulpit. <laughs> this is my pulpit. This thing, you can't even pick this thing up. I mean, it's heavy. Good luck coming up here and to preach. Uh, Actually, as I recall, as I looked at scripture, God gifts many people to do teaching. There are people in this church that are gifted in teaching. It's not just Pastor Jeff. And so we have got to be careful of entitlement and, and those things. Uh, McDonald's, McDonald's has a slogan that deals with entitlement. It says this, you deserve a break today. You deserve it. You deserve it. And we got to be careful of that. We have to be careful as Christians to rise up in entitlement and say, I deserve this. And look over at what I did, like Samson did with this carcass. Look over at what I did and go from there. So entitlement is something we've got to watch out for. Number three, a third attitude that we've got to be careful of that destroyed Samson is I can handle it. I can handle this. And that's pride. And verse number 10 says, Now his father went down to see the woman, and Samson made a feast there, as was customary for bridegrooms. When he appeared, he was given 30 companions. Now, to really fully understand this point, you need to understand what kind of arrogance does it take to sit here as a Nazarite, go into a Philistine camp, take one of their women, and then throw a party for yourself in their camp and invite 30 people to your wedding feast. That's arrogance, tremendous arrogance. That's a tremendously arrogant person and is filled with pride. Samson thinks that he can handle this, so he throws a wedding feast for himself and invites 30 other people, or 30 people were given to him, and he thinks that he can handle it. He also is so arrogant to say, here, let me tell you a riddle, and he gives a riddle. And as we're gonna read probably next week, the riddle comes back and bites him, and, and he gets really upset as his wife is given to somebody else. But Samson is just walking in arrogance as he's saying, I can basically handle this. I can handle this. I have God's strength and I can deal with this. And we've got to be careful. Samson lost his mind. He thinks that he can handle it. And that kind of thinking is just filled with pride. You got to be careful to not say, you know, I can, ha I can handle this and I deserve this and I want this. Those are the three attitudes that can destroy you. Ladies, have you ever been on a trip with your man who is driving and you get lost or he gets lost and you say, honey, would you like me to pull over and get some directions? What is his answer? No. What is it? I got it. I'll figure it out. He knows, just as well as you know, and the kids in the back seat know, you all are lost. You don't, know, you, don't, you don't even know where you're going. And yet the guy says, I can handle it. I've been guilty of that. No, I know where I'm going. 20 minutes later, I'm still not there. Finally, i got to figure out, okay, where are the directions? This was, of course, long before smartphones, where you had to do Rand McNally and pull out the map and all that, ask the gas station attendant. But we got to be careful of that. Why? Because a man can say, and anybody can say, I can handle this. I can handle. And we've got to be careful that we got to be careful. That's centered and rooted in pride. And that's exactly what Samson did by throwing himself a wedding feast, or at least a feast, and inviting Philistines to it. Um, last week, I went for a hike over in Poway, a great hike. It's a level seven hike. Um, it was up to Potato Chip Rock. Has anybody ever heard of that? So yeah, okay. Any, anybody ever do that? Potato chip rock? Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, great. 
four of us. So there's, uh, a lo it was a big hike, and I wasn't properly equip equipped, but I got up to that rock, and when you get up to the potato chip rock, um, you have to like jump over to get to the actual rock. And then to go back, you have to either swing up your legs. You guys know what I'm talking about. You got to get back up this rock or you got to go down to the right. And um, I was trying forever to get back up to go down the hill. And so I was trying to swing my legs and do a press and, and get up on this rock. And I was struggling. I mean, I was exhausted, first of all. It was a, let me just complain for a moment. It was like a two-hour two hour hike almost to get there. I mean, it was exhausting. And I'm trying to get back up on this rock to get down it. Anyway, this guy comes up and he says, dude, he says, just go right down there. You got long legs and long arms. Just go down to the right. And guess what my answer was? <clears throat> I got this. So I'm trying again, trying to get back up on that rock, and it just wasn't happening. It wasn't happening at all. And so finally, uh, I make up in my mind that, okay, I'm going to take his advice. I look to see if he's still there. And Yeah, right? So finally, I go down, and guess what? He was right, and I couldn't handle it. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get back up. I mean, how embarrassing is that? It's brutal. I'm not 21 anymore. But... I went, I went down, and he was right. And that's exactly what we have got to be careful of. I mean, that's a funny illustration, but we've got to be careful of saying, I can handle it. Okay, here are attitudes that make weak men strong. It's actually the exact opposite of Samson's attitudes. A weak man is going to be made strong when he says, number one, I want God. Not only do, right, we're not saying, I want it. We're saying, I want God. God is it. He is the one that I want to put back on the throne in my life. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? And so a godly man, a godly person, wants God above everything else. And we've got to be careful that we don't keep taking God off the throne of our lives. And it's so easy to do. But we want all these other things. I mean, how often, when was the last time you told God, God, I just want you. I just want you, Lord. I just want you. Jesus is enough. I just want you. And that is, what is, uh, that is what God wants for us. He wants us to desire him above everything else because things in life fall into alignment when we want God more than everything else. But when we start taking him off the throne and putting other things on the throne, that's when our life begins to get screwed up and we begin to uh, make huge mistakes. Psalm 63, verse number one says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you and my body longs for you. Oh, I'm, th I'm looking there at that prayer. And I'm like, oh man, my, my soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you. And earnestly, I seek you. God, you are my God. And so what makes weak men strong is when we can say, God, you're the one that I want above everything else. And we know that's a process. We know that sometimes some days are easier than others, right? Amen. Some days we're able to do that. Some weeks we're stronger than others. But in the long run, we want to be able to say, God, you're stronger or you're, you're more desirable than all the riches in the world or anything else because he really does own the world and everything in it. The second thing, the second attitude that makes weak men strong is not I deserve it. It's this. I deserve death. You say, wow, that's good news, Jeff. Thank you. I deserve death. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. In Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love through us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're going to take communion at the end of this uh, here in just three minutes. We're going to take communion. We're going to close the service with communion. And oftentimes I'll say this, and this is true. Jesus got what we deserved, and we got what Jesus deserved. We got freedom, and we got let off the hook, and Jesus went to the cross, when really, we should be on the cross, and Jesus, the Son of God, who had no sin, should be free. But Jesus took his, our sin, and he took the sins of the world on him, and he went to the cross. And so he got what we deserved, and we got what he deserved. And so a healthy, a healthy mentality here as a child of God is to say, I don't deserve anything. I deserve death. I deserve death on the cross. But while uh, I am sinning, God demonstrated his love for me that Christ died for us. And so that's a very healthy perspective is I want God, 
I deserve death. And then the third thing that makes a weak man strong is this mentality here. I can't handle anything without God. I can't do anything. Nada. Is that nothing, right? I can't do nada without God. John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do, if Jesus was Spanish, he would say, nada. You can do nothing. Nothing. My question for us, for me, for you, is this. Are you trying to live your life without God? Are you trying to live? Are you trying to do all these accomplishments and accomplish all of these goals and do all of these things, raise your children, grow your business, do all these things without God? Because Jesus says, apart from me, there's nothing you can do. You can't do anything. And so it's very healthy. It's very healthy to put Jesus and God back on the throne of your hearts. Put them back on the throne in your life. Don't leave here today. Don't take communion without putting God back on the throne of your heart and just saying, you know, God, I've blown it. I've messed up. Uh, I haven't even talked to you this week. I haven't read my Bible. I haven't prayed. But for this moment right now, I just want to put you back on the throne of my life. You're worth it. You know what it does to God when he hears you say, God, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're worthy of all of my praise. So we, we've got to be careful, and I want to have the ushers here come forward. We're going to end the service with communion. Have the worship team come forward. We're going to sing a song. And this is kind of tied into Samson here, and here's how. Samson made several small decisions that eventually lead to his demise. We're going to look at next week. We're going to look at Samson, how he was emotionally driven and not spirit-led. He's, he was emotionally driven. He was driven by his emotions, and he wasn't spirit-led. But today, when we take communion, just want to encourage you to understand that you got what Jesus deserved, and Jesus got what you deserved. And I want to invite you to place God back on the throne of your hearts and on your lives with this act of communion. It's basically saying, Jesus, thank you. I don't deserve this, but thank you. Forgive me of my sins. I take this communion before you and for you, and I want to put you back on the throne of my heart, on my heart. So let's pray. We'll take communion. The worship team will sing. We're going to take communion together today, so if you could just hold the cracker and the juice, and then we'll do it, we'll do it together. Father, <clears throat> thank you for your word. Thank you that it's living and active. Thank you, God, that we can look into a character like Samson, and we can relate. Lord, we can relate. We can understand a little bit about those mistakes. Help us not make the same mistakes, God. Help us to put you back on the throne of our hearts. Help us to say, I want God, I want Jesus more than anything else in our lives. So I just pray, Lord, for this communion. I pray that it will be a special moment for every person taking it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.